This is a Dreamcast disc and is for use only on a Dreamcast unit. Playing this disc on a hi-fi or other audio equipment can cause serious damage to its speakers. Dreamcast, up to six billion players. Welcome back to the stage of history. Why don't we play together? Hey, 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 it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go! Please stop this disc now. Now, 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 now. Hello and welcome to episode 27 of the Dreamcast Junkyard Dream Pod. I should I say episode 27. I, I probably should be calling it episode 26.5 because this will be a slightly shorter episode of the Dream Pod and uh, it will be hosted by myself, Tom, and uh, my, my good friend and co-host, Caleb. How are you doing, Caleb? Hello, I'm doing fine. Hey, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> Are you expecting a reply? Rob? Eh, Gagaman? Gaz? <laughs> Scott? Where Scott, are Ross? they? <laughs> it's just me and you. Oh my god. It's like an echo chamber. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so like I say, this is more like episode 26.5 rather than a full blown episode 27. However, we hope to entertain and educate you, just like the BBC do on occasion. Maybe slightly lofty, uh, <laughs> lofty claims. We're not on the on the same level as BBC. However, we uh, well, we're, we're free of advertising, so I suppose we're on the same level in some ways. Anyway, enough waffle from me. Caleb, we'll begin as we always do, and we we shall uh, talk about what we've been playing on the old Dreamcast or on current gen or other systems. What have you been doing? I've been doing a lot of stuff. Mostly though, I've been trying to get my stuff cleaned because my God. The uh, If you don't store your stuff correctly, it is going to corrode and whatnot. So, unfortunately, I found out that one of my arcade sticks had gotten all of a sudden, just kind of seemingly randomly, had gotten yellowing. Which is strange, because I have three of them, and I, they've all been stored the same way. Yet, all, all of a sudden, one just all of a sudden completely yellowed. I, I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> So have you managed to like get rid of the yellowing? Because no, no, not yet. I've 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 got to do the whole process, I think, mm-hmm. and that includes taking it completely apart and just uh, uh, either using the pre-made stuff that you can buy online or using your method that you showed on the Dreamcast Junkyard, which everybody should look up. Yeah, and um, the reason I ask is because I've got the uh, the arcade twin sticks, which do have quite a lot of yellowing on them, and I I know I did the thing with the the Dreamcast shells with the um, with the hair serum. But uh, I'm not entirely sure whether that works on the arcade sticks or the twin sticks, because, just because they're made of metal and they've got the uh, the white kind of like uh, powder coating on them. So I'm not entirely sure if it works on that or if it's just for the plastic. So I'd be quite interested to see how that uh, how that turns out for you. Yes, yes. And in addition, I found out I'm completely out of the loop. And this was years ago. Somebody did a <laughs> translation of a Japanese game that I want to do a video on. Hmm. And I wanted to play it like back in 2010 and see if I could play it. Because uh, it's an action game. It's called Frame Grid. Oh, and yeah. apparently, somebody did a translation for it. So now, most of the menus and whatnot are in English, and it's a lot easier to play. I'd like to ask you about this, because I, I know about a translation. I have the Japanese version of the game, and it's from uh, from Software, the guys who did uh, Bloodborne and uh, all the Dark Souls games. And it does have quite a, a similar style when it comes to like the menus and things. It's got kind of like a, a gothic style. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, See, I don't understand how people are actually playing it. On, is it... So, I mean, sorry, I, I know I'm waffling here. How does the translation project work? Is it is it a ROM that you use on a uh, an SD card or... No, no, no. This is a full... It's just a... a it's, there's probably an SD version. I'm just working off the disc version. Okay, so you burn it to a disc and then play it in your Dreamcast. Yep, yep. Yeah, okay. I was thinking maybe that it was something that you... It's a legally gray area, I would say, even if you own the Japanese game like I do. Yeah, I mean, I played the Japanese version a little bit, but as I say, I can't really understand what's happening. Um, to me, it kind of struck me as a... Uh, apologies, <laughs> but a, uh, a poor man's version of Virtual On. So, yep. Hmm. Anything else, Caleb? Anything else you've been playing or experimenting with? I've been messing around with uh, just a bunch of stuff, but unfortunately, uh, boy, I get a lot of my stuff secondhand, and boy, there is absolutely zero, zero Dreamcast games uh, around my area right now. Uh, so I said, I guess that says something about the video game market, because uh, normally after the Christmas season, you can find people's old games in the thrift stores and whatnot. Uh, not so this year. Hardly anything. It seems then that uh, upstate New York is quite similar to uh, 
down country UK because <laughs> uh, where I live in Southampton, there is nothing, absolutely nothing Dreamcast related in any of the shops you go in, um, yeah. even the uh, the second hand shops, things like that. I've been playing mainly on my PS4, to be honest, and uh, on my Vita. I recently got a game called Rainbow Moon, which is a, an RPG for the uh, the Vita, and I, I don't like RPGs. In fact, I'm pretty much a, a non-RPG player, and um, this game has captivated me. Uh, I've been playing it non-stop for the last week or so, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's perfect for a handheld, because you can literally just like shove your face into the screen and just forget about the world around you. It's a really good game, and uh, I would recommend it to anyone who's got a Vita. I know it came out on the PS4 last week, I believe. What kind of main mechanics are there? Is it just the standard uh, kind of uh, Japanese RPG Final Fantasy type system? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh, but I think basically because of the artwork, it, it, I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that it's, it or, originates from Japan. I think it's a Western RPG in the style of a Japanese RPG just because of the, the artwork that goes with it. It's very Amiga-ish, if, if that makes, uh, makes sense, i.e. not very well drawn, uh, certainly in the menus. But when you're actually playing it, it's from like an, an isometric 3D-ish view. You know, remember, do you remember the old FIFA International Soccer games on the Mega Drive? So Genesis, that kind of weird... Sorry, I'm American, so none of us who care about soccer. <laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. <laughs> do I remember an Amiga game? <laughs> <laughs> I do forget who I'm speaking to occasionally, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm a deprived youth. Everybody who doesn't know my background is is that my parents made this somewhat weird decision of not allowing me to have any video games at all, which of course means now that I'm an adult, I own tons of video games. Yeah, likewise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I think that's usually how it works. So my first console that I owned, aside from the Game Gear... Uh, was actually a Dreamcast console in college. Yeah, I've gone back. I've gotten a bunch of them. You know, I have a Mattel Aquarius. If we want to talk about uh, games on the Mattel Aquarius, Tom. Uh, but yeah, no, I've I've got a lot of but the mainstream stuff. So, so stuff like the there's the whole there's this whole generation of stuff like the uh, the Mega generation and whatnot that I just don't. I'm not. I'm not really involved with, unfortunately. So you're trying to tell me you didn't have a Spectrum? No, I did not. I did not have a Zeddy <laughs> Spectrum or whatever <laughs> people call it. Did the Spectrum even come out in America? Oh, no, no. I have. You know what I have, though? I have the ColecoVision uh, of controller. So it's the joystick with all the ColecoVision games in it. Speaking of ColecoVision, shall we uh, talk about that? Oh, sure, sure. For those people listening, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you already know about this, but... Uh, the, uh, the ColecoVision Chameleon, this is completely off topic as far as Dreamcast is concerned, but I thought this was a really interesting story just because I like to talk about interesting stories <laughs> that I see online. So basically the ColecoVision Chameleon is a system that is a um, an evolution, shall we say, of the, the retro VGS, and that is the thing that is a, a retro system in the style of the, maybe in the uh, style of the Ouya crossed with a uh, yes a retron they specifically said though that they were going to be able to have like um they were going to have a much broader catalog of games that could be played on the system yeah but i mean they're all through like cartridge and it's it's not online enabled which is you know it's a noble a noble effort from uh the retro vgs I understand guys what they said like when i first got the uh i believe it was uh um it was one of the D D games and it was the neverwinter nights 2 collection and this was the platinum collection and so i got that game and like it was the platinum collection i didn't have internet at the time yeah so i assumed that i was only getting games where yeah so i put the platinum collection in and it didn't work and actually the platinum collection of the game required an online patch which i i had to mess around and finally get but you know, I so that I understand the frustration because back in the day, games at least would work mostly. There would be bugs and stuff, but like if a game came out, it would work. And I think that's kind of what they're reaching at too. It's like a cartridge game where you don't have to update it, and it's just a game, and it's finished, and it will work when you plug it in your system. Yeah, I mean, like I say, it's a, it's a noble, uh, it's a noble idea. However, uh, apparently, this last week, the they had the. Uh, the ColecoVision Chameleon at the New York Toy Fair on display as a, as a, a prototype, and somebody noticed that it looked a hell of a lot like they put a, a SNES Junior. Wait a minute, I've <laughs> seen the pictures. Oh my, oh my God, it's, it's former governor. Jesse Ventura. And conspiracy theorist. I visited the New York game show, and I saw it myself. 
I saw that they were playing games on it. So how do, how do you explain that, Tom? Well, <laughs> I saw the proof with my own eyes. Some people uh, more learned than I am from the Atari Age forums have analysed the images and said that this is quite clearly a Super Nintendo Junior inside an Atari Jaguar shell. So wait a minute. You're saying this is some sort of conspiracy? Possibly. Make your own mind up. Have a look at the images on the internet. If if people are interested, the Atari age actually had an excellent little write-up where somebody actually dissected a Nintendo and put it in there, and it looked remarkably like how the setup was at the game show. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I mean, uh, they said that they would have a working prototype at the New York game show. Sorry, the New York toy show. And then this is what they actually arrive with. It's quite, uh, quite. Misleading. I guess it's a loose, loose definition of prototype. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, I obviously wasn't there, and I can't really comment from a, a, you know on the on the floor kind of perspective. But uh, yeah, it's very it's very fishy, shall we say? There was no power light. There was uh, the the controllers went into the case whether you couldn't see where the controllers were actually plugged in. It was meant to have a HDMI out on the back, but if you look at the back of it, it's literally just a, a SNES it weren't, weren't, was it, it was plugged into a CRT TV as well. Yes, yeah, that's, so that's basically one of the main things that people have got an issue with. Uh, it's an interesting story. If you if you want more information on this, you just go to Google and type ColecoVision Chameleon and then Super Nintendo or whatever, and you'll find it. Uh, Pat the Nest Punk did one on his uh, CU podcast uh, where... On on YouTube, where they basically go through the the entire thing, and uh, yeah, it's quite, yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting. Anyway, Caleb, let's uh, let's move on from that, and uh, let's move on to our first topic of the uh, of the day, and that is what's the best scrolling beat 'em up on the Dreamcast? Indeed, are there any scrolling beat 'em ups on the Dreamcast? This is something I've been pondering about for a while because I was uh, playing on my old favorite Streets of Rage two uh, on the uh, on the Retron five with my girlfriend the other day, and I was thinking to myself. Why aren't there any games like this on the Dreamcast? Now, we've spoken, I'm pretty sure, in brief about Streets of Rage 4. Oh, yeah. There was a couple of screenshots about what that game was supposed to look like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have been quite interesting to see a, a polygonal Streets of Rage game on the Dreamcast. And like you say, there are some screenshots floating around on the internet. Um, and, yeah, it, it, basically that was cancelled. But there were other games in that mold that you can't actually play. And uh, I've got a, a very short list here of games. So we've got uh, things like Sword of the Berserk, Guts Rage. We've got uh, Zombie Revenge, uh, Dynamite Cop or Dynamite Decker 2. Uh, and then obviously on the old uh, Sega Smash Pack, we've got the actual real deal, Streets of Rage, Golden Axe. And <laughs> I've put Altered Beast on here as well. I'm not sure if that actually like qualifies as a... I'm not a, quite sure. I will say, though, that's the Streets of Rage with horribly emulated music. <laughs> oh, God, it's horrendous. I did a, a, an article on the uh, Dreamcast Junkyard main site maybe about two weeks ago about how bad the emulated sound is. And yeah. it's just like MIDI sound. It's it's like ear-bleedingly bad. Yeah. I mean, it's just you know, it's poor emulation. Of those that you mentioned, I would have to say Sword of the Berserk. It's a hack and slash game, and I I just love that game so much. I beat it completely, even though it's a very, very difficult game. The gameplay is just so satisfying when you swing the big dragon sword and you shoot somebody with your cannon. Oh, it's just it's amazing. For me, it's the the story mode that is uh, is really cool. I know that it's kind of lambasted because it has quite lengthy cutscenes, which do take up the vast majority of the game. But I think when you do actually get control of guts and you are like you know basically lopping heads off and just basically kicking ass with this massive sword, it is possibly one of the most satisfying. Scrolling beat em ups on the Dreamcast. Of these other ones, though, Caleb, what, what do you think about Zombie Revenge? Uh, Zombie Revenge is like, it didn't enthrall me as much because I went through there. You know, it's got its connections to House of the Dead and whatnot. It's interesting and it's somewhat fun, but I only played it by myself and I just couldn't get past the one, I think it's the fourth or third boss in. And I just never got really past that part. Uh, there's a lot of interesting facets to it and it's it, i'm sure it'd be much funner to play it with you know the uh the two-player thing on the subject of it being related to house of the dead 2 uh, when i first read the reviews of it i assumed that it would be basically the house of the dead 2 in like kind of third person so when i when i first got it and started playing it, i was like this isn't house of the dead what what they're talking about i mean so can you shed any light on that i mean it, it, what's the connection with house of the dead 2 it's very tenuous Okay. Uh, I know that the again, I haven't played this in a long time, but I think they're supposedly members of the same group. 
Oh, okay. And uh, I believe the bad guy has something to do with gold. And the zombies and the monsters that you're fighting are supposedly somewhat related to the events of House of the Dead 2. Again, I, I don't know. <laughs> See, I mean, I, again, I, I should have looked into this. <laughs> it's, it's tenuous because I don't remember it at all. <laughs> and then, and then, of course, Dynamite Deca 2. I mean, that's just that's just super fun. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, just yeah. just that's an arcadey as arcadey gets. Yeah, you know, hitting people with fish and whatnot, <laughs> and uh, you know. It, it, it's, it basically, that's one of the first games I played on the Dreamcast. My friend got one. It was a Japanese one. He got a Japanese copy of this game yeah. with, the, with the system. And we played that constantly over and over and over again. And, we, you know, it was just because it was so ridiculous and it looked so good at the time. And um, actually, that said, um, a few weeks ago, Rob came to my house. And this is the game. We, the first game we played was uh, was Dynamite Cop. And it was just great fun. When you get to the end and you have to like fight each other to, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, it was just they, great. They, fun. In course, in the US, they, they, I'm interested to know if they did the same thing in the UK. In the US, the first game, which was released, I believe, on the Saturn, and yes. I know it was released on that, was actually Die Hard. Yes, and that's they true, actually. Yeah. So did they do that in the UK too? Yeah, yeah, it was a Die Hard arcade. Yeah, same. I mean, it even has the same like quick time events as you're going through levels. You know, you have to like press a certain button to like punch press kick. in the face. Yeah, chong, yeah, yeah. Chong, 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 chong. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what do we think about? Uh, should we include Streets of Rage and Golden Axe in this? So, or... I I would say there's one that you missed up, and that's of course the uh, the homebrew Beats of Rage. Oh yes. Yes, because there's like a million versions of that, and mm. a lot of them are on the Dreamcast. There's the there's the, everything from the ICP inspired Hatchet Ninjas to the uh, to the Resident Evil Beats of Rage version. There's just a ton of them. Caleb, I've got a bit of a an admission to make. I've never actually played Beats of Rage. Uh, it's interesting. It's basically like a straight up two D beat 'em up. You walk from left to right. You beat up stuff. People mostly use sprites from uh, all the great 2D uh, fighters out there, and it's just it's it's they're usually just a little bit of fun. I've seen um, I've seen lots of like screenshots of it. I, I mean, even things like the uh, isn't there an X Men version? I'm I'm unaware of that, but I'm sure there is. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different versions of this game; it's ridiculous. Uh, but because I a own a Mac and I can't really burn that much stuff with it that runs in the Dreamcast. And also, I'm an idiot. So even with a PC, I you know find myself uh, burning multiple coasters. Yeah, it was a real shame because back in the day, the uh, um, the Dreamcast Homebrews website was still up, and you could get all the versions uh, that were uh, had the very good burning. Uh, yeah, but now you, you'd have to kind of look around from a little bit. I'm, I think there is still a Beats of Rage main website where you can download most of them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because when I try and burn stuff, I use my girlfriend's uh, Windows PC laptop, and uh, I have a thing on there called Boot Dreams, which generally works quite well, but a lot of stuff, you, I mean, I burn it, and then it just doesn't run. I'm just like, what am I doing wrong? I'm, I'm just a complete idiot. I set up Image Word, which is a bit of a pain, um, but yeah, ever since I did that, I haven't burnt any coasters at all. It's, they've all worked. Anyway, um, so are we? Uh, I mean, what we decided on here. What's the best? Is it sort of the Berserk? Or? I mean, I'm yeah. I'm sort of the Berserk is. It's just it's an amazing game. I yeah. would have to say that's the best. Yeah, I think I'll, uh, I'll agree with you there. So, uh, anyone who's listening who likes a Zombie Revenge or Dynamite Cop, we apologize, but we both like sort of the Berserk. So, uh, I mean, if you have more than one player, then obviously I would go with Dynamite Cop. Definitely over over Zombie Revenge every day. I still remember how I got my copy. I went to a thrift shop and I specifically had told the lady, please, if there's any Dreamcast games, uh, just let me know. And she didn't. And just one day I wandered in and there's just a big stack of Dreamcast games there in the wrong section. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I went up to the music section. I was able to get that and a bunch of other games. So that's how I got my version of uh, Dynamite Cop. Um, to be honest, I'd be quite interested to know like how you actually spot them because in the UK, if you go into a like a charity shop or a thrift shop, um, oh, yeah. you you will see the dream cap. You, you can spot them a mile away because it's like light blue and they're quite thick and they you know you can see them here. Here in the US, it's a little bit different because a lot of times, because of GameStop's lovely policies, they won't have any of the cases or anything, so they'll be in blank cases. Uh, it, well, especially for this area, I think it's different from where you are. But uh, yeah, no, you just have to, you, they usually have the little video game section, which is usually very picked over. And then you can also have the little just CD area where sometimes people who just don't know just put them in there. 
And yeah, so basically I just, just check those two sections and see. Uh, usually because uh, I don't know how your shops are set up, but they usually have the giant spinning racks of discs. Mm. That's usually the setup here in thrift shops. Yeah, I was in a shop yesterday, actually, in fact, and I was looking for, uh, I just went in just to have a look around, and they had uh, an Xbox section, uh, you know, original Xbox, and there was a guy with his phone. He had his phone in his hand. He had one of the massive tablet phones. Yeah, he, had, yeah. Well, he, he had... was scanning the barcode codes? No, no, he was. He had eBay o- open on his uh, on his. Screen. No, no, they, see, they go a step further here. They have barcode scanners. That they actually scan the barcodes and then they know if either – they do it with books and video games. And they can scan it and they can see how much it's worth. And oh, that's how man. they decide what to get. It's hor- It's it's oh. resellers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, so they, they don't guy. care anything about the games or books. But if there's anything worth anything, they'll scan the barcode and then they'll just buy it via that. That's insane. Yeah, uh, this guy who uh, was actually stood in front of the Xbox section when I got there. And he was stood there with eBay open. And he was looking up and down on his phone, I could see. And then he suddenly, as I like, kind of stood next to him, he grabbed one of the games off the shelf and put it under his arm. And I don't know what it was. So was it, yeah. an exp- you know, was it something expensive? I don't know. Here's but- the thing. Even back in 2010, I, and here's, the, here's where people say, oh, the video game market, it's a bubble. It's going to burst soon. I don't know because it seems to be expanding. Because back in 2010, nobody was really looking for rare PS1, Xbox games. I could literally walk into the thrift shops and there would just be a big wall of the PS2, Xbox, GameCube games. And all the rare expensive games were still there, like Godzilla and whatnot. And now I go to the same shops and those have been completely picked over. Anything worth anything has been taken. So it's 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 very interesting that like people are saying, oh, it's a video game bubble. It's not going to happen. But even in later years, it's actually expanded into the newer generation games. Yeah, yeah, totally. Even even like uh, things like the, the the Vita, like when you see some shops still have like a physical Vita section, and you'll see them there, like looking on the phones and like grabbing the games off the shelves. You know, the ones that are more expensive and like things like um, uh, Marvel vs. Capcom three for the Vita is quite uncommon. And there's a shop near me that had like two copies of it, and I went back the next day; it was gone. Both copies yeah. gone. I mean, we we can talk about this whole thing, like the uh, the one Wii U game that came out uh, that everybody was speculating on. Uh, I forget the name of it. It wasn't a good <laughs> <That's> game. <helpful. laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's move on, anyway, shall we, to the uh, the next section. And, um, well, we're going to have a, a, a quick discussion about a game that maybe not many people in the UK have played. I'm not very sure about the uh, the US. But uh, in June 2000, IGN said, if you're one of those Dungeons & Dragons dorks or belong to the Society of Creative Anachronisms, then you will love this game, no matter what the reviewers say. But for the average gamer, Draconis is a fun little title whose shortcomings in graphics and other areas will warn you the further you get in. Now, Caleb, this game is called Draconis, Cult of the Worm. In the UK, it's known as Dragon's Blood. I don't know why they actually changed the name. Does Draconis have like some kind of symbolism or meaning in the US? I bet you they just didn't want to have blood in the title. Because <laughs> this was around that same time when, you know, the whole, they're trying to rename stuff. No, I don't think anybody in the US knows what Draconis means. It's just, I think they just changed it to make it sound a little bit different. Either that, or maybe there was a copyright issue with a game that has similar title, and so they couldn't have Dragon in the title. If you look at the name, you've got Cult of the Worm, which is spelled in the Old English way, but... There's no game that's called Cult of the Worm or has the word worm in it, you know, yeah. in the UK. Well, it, ah. it, it's just, it's another it's another word for dragon. So instead of having the word dragon in there, they would have two words that kind of meant dragon. <laughs> I'm assuming that's what their thought process was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Caleb, what's your experience with this game? Uh, it's a fun little uh, hack and slash. Mm. You know, you walk around and you hit stuff and there's, the, the gameplay is okay, but like you said, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit shallow, uh, but still still fun. There's a lot of like really good dialogue from like the uh, the the guy 
the girl uh it's it's interesting because uh it's i think they were going for like uh the people who translated it, i think they were going for like a, a evil dead feel for mm. the dialogue that was coming from the guy like a bit like a bit comedic kind of thing yeah yeah definitely yeah, um, my my history with the game is that I, I went to the, the shop that I used to go to when I was at college, and it was just there on the shelf. I, I didn't know anything about it. I'd never seen any reviews. That was the thing in the, and certainly in the UK, in the early days of the Dreamcast, games would just appear on the shelves before the magazines had come out, and you just wouldn't know what they were. And so I saw this game, Dragon's Blood. I had a look at the back of the box. I thought, that looks quite cool. Got it, took it home, and I was kind of in two minds. I thought, this is interesting but i don't really like it so i took it back about two days later and said something along the lines of i don't like it i want to change it and they were like okay it's only in recent times when i've like you know re-got it and re- replayed it that i actually kind of appreciate how good it really is it's not perfect by any means um as you say caleb the graphics are quite decent in places but the the environments because you are allowed to wander around this like in most of the levels these massive open environments because of the I'm guessing the limitations of the Dreamcast. Uh, there's quite a lot of fogging, so you can't really see that far into the distance, and monsters will just literally appear out of the out of the fog and start attacking you. That said, the controls are quite good, and the combat is quite reminiscent, for me anyway, of um, Ocarina of Time. It would have been better if you had the proper lock on, so you could do like you yeah, know backflips yeah. and like side jumps and things. But yeah, I mean, I quite quite liked it, and um, even though the jumping is quite floaty. I thought it was really good. Also, the the guy who does the the voiceover work for the um, you know the in between levels where he introduces the different stages is very uh, is very good. At, I'm pretty sure that he was um, a, a film actor or something. Let me just quickly have a look and see who it was because I'm pretty sure he's quite a big name uh, actor who did that. The old Parthem Empire was devastated by the backlash. Just more than a hundred years ago, the magical destruction ended mankind's golden age. Its magnificent cities, gone. Its mighty wizards and wise sages, annihilated. Since the backlash, life became cheap and peace hard to come by. Yeah, so uh, so some of the uh, some of the voiceover works really good, and the uh, the graphics are quite impressive, certainly for the uh, interiors. George Takei, George Takei, rather. I believe he was the voice of the king. Oh wow! Cool. So that's so we've got George Takai in Draconis. We've got uh, Leonard Nimoy in uh, in Seaman. <laughs> Who else is going to pop up in different random Dreamcast games? Hi, uh, this is Tom from the future, just interjecting in the podcast. Uh, I did actually look up who the guy is who plays the narrator in Dragon's Blood or Draconis. His name was Tony J. He passed away sadly in two thousand and six, but. On his uh, IMDb page, you will note that he was in things like Treasure Planet. Uh, He mainly did uh, video game voiceover work. But interestingly, he also played the role of Supersonic in the uh, 1993 Sonic the Hedgehog animated series. So uh, there's a nice little factoid for you there. Anyway, back to the original show. Yeah, uh, there was one level where you actually fought the uh, the Minotaur in this like floating castle, and I always remember that approach to the main castle being really impressive with the uh, the clouds floating above the uh, the ramparts of the castle. You know, um, yeah, it was a decent enough uh, hack and slash. Any closing thoughts on that one, Caleb? Uh, not really. It just kind of reminds me uh, that I need to really take a quick look at uh, Record of Lotus War and uh, go and do a full review of that one because I played that recently and it's just it's it's really fast. It's like it's like a fast Diablo one, and so I need to I need to maybe give that another shot and see what uh, what's up with that. Did you ever play a game called Silver? Yes, I tried. That was a very Zelda esque game, but it wasn't. For some reason, like the weird, like Final Fantasy VII type graphics and stuff, it wasn't, it didn't capture my attention very well. Yeah, with the the um, like pre-rendered backgrounds and the sort of small like polygonal characters. Yeah, maybe around. a bit of a second chance though. It's been a while since I actually looked at that one. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, back in the day, I would play these games and I'd, I'd put them on and I'd be like, oh, I don't really like this. It's a bit crap. But with like a, an older head. You know, looking back at these games, I kind of appreciate them a bit more. So certainly things like Record of Lodos War, I will give uh, another chance. And also uh, Silver again, I think I'll, I'll go back to and have a look at. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's as you mature as a gamer, you kind of appreciate these games a little bit more. I was always in the mindset that 
Dreamcast games should be these big bombastic arcade yeah, games. Arcade-y. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and with hindsight, there probably are some games that we've brushed over or just like missed, you know, over the years. So yeah, interesting, interesting thoughts. Anyway, as this is going to be a, quite a short episode, just because we've not got a lot of time left on our uh, server for this month, I think we shall uh, bring it to a close there, Kevad. Thank you very much for joining me. It's a uh, as usual, been a pleasure. Is there anything you want to uh, plug or give a shout out to? Uh, speaking of Dungeons and Dragons stuff, uh, I'm still doing video game stuff on my YouTube channel. That's mm-hmm. Blandco. It's Bland Co. Blandco on YouTube. I'm also doing some uh, videos on Dungeons and Dragons type uh, stuff, like pre painted miniatures and some of the uh, some of the dungeon dressing and dungeon tile stuff you can buy and paint and whatnot. Cool. So take a look if you're interested in that. Uh, take a look at my YouTube. Excellent. Um, on that subject, Caleb, did you actually manage to find any of those gauntlet miniatures that you were looking for? No, I found one that looked like it was a jester from like Gauntlet Two or, or one of those games. But it, it's I gotta go. I gotta keep on going. I don't think I have any. But uh, it is amazing when you. I went through my miniatures. I found some that were actually from Diablo Two, uh, and those are actually pretty uh, rare as well. But uh, no, no gauntlet miniatures from that. Yeah, for people who are listening who don't know what we're talking about, the the, uh, the Dreamcast launch of Gauntlet Legends, I believe, had certainly in the US had a, a promotion where they were giving away um, miniatures of the characters that were made of like pewter. Yes, very low, very low runs of the white metal pewter. Which is the favored, yeah. Incredibly uncommon, incredi- incredibly rare. So if you if you have some of those, uh, keep hold of them. Or it, actually, let Caleb know, and uh, <laughs> he might <laughs> take them off you. Potentially. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Um, yeah. So that'll you know that'll do for this particular shortish episode. Um, I've been Tom. That's been Caleb. And uh, <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter at Sega Junkyard, or you can follow us on uh, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Dreamcast Junkyard. And of course, you can also go to the main Dreamcast Junkyard site, which is all the W's dot the Dreamcast Junkyard dot co dot UK. And, uh, and yeah, uh, thank you as ever for listening and uh, putting up with our rambling. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the next one. We, 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 we will have a, a full complement of uh, co-hosts. Not that you're not a uh, good co-host, Gary, of course. Well, I, I certainly wasn't one today. <laughs> Anyway, guys, thank you very much for listening. And if you like what you heard, then either go and listen to our back catalogue or, you know, if you get the chance, go and give us a uh, a review on iTunes because it would mean the world to us. But, uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. And uh, as ever, keep dreaming. Please stop this disc now. 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 Now.